Jay Day Frary here. Welcome to this edition of the Trackside Modeler. In this video, I'm going to show you how I'm going to build a small HON30 display using Pico Track and a lot of HON30 equipment that I've collected over the years. The theme of this little railroad is going to be Cuban sugarcane. The railroad is going to be built on just a little pine frame with a sheet of one inch blue foam and you can see on the blue foam where I've marked out where the track will go. I've also cut a ditch where I'm going to build a little bit of a river. We're going to mount the track. I'm going to pre-assemble some of it. We're going to mount it on double sided carpet tape right on top of the blue foam and then I'll wire it and then we'll test run a train or two. Here's a little bridge that I made ahead of time just for this project. It's a piece of another plastic HO bridge that I cut out to fit in the stream opening and then I glued to each end the abutments so that when a time comes I can just set this into the stream. As you can see it fits right in here very nicely into my little stream bed and this black line here represents where the track is going to be laid and I'm going to lay the track right over the bridge. Several of the things that I've used to help me lay this out are these cardboard and plastic templates. I made these. This is a 12 inch radius marked on this piece of heavy plastic and at the top you can see an 18 inch radius and these are used on the railroad to mark out where the track line will go and that way I know that I have the proper radius. I also made a smaller one for a little mine railroad I'm going to build. This has a 10 inch and an 8 inch radius. So these little tools come in handy when you're laying out a railroad and or you're adding on to your existing railroad. I also laid out the roads <laughs> using this little piece of 1 by 3 strapping. This is just a scrap out of the scrap box, but it makes the right width for an HO road. And I like it because I'm going to have a road coming through the middle of this display and it's going to start up here and it's going to run down this way and eventually over a grade crossing down at the end here. So all I did was lay the piece of wood on the display, take a pen, mark it, move it, mark it, move it, mark it, and now I've got a pretty good representation of where I want my road to go and how I want it to curve through the scene. These are an HON30 Pico turnout. They're very nicely made and I use these for all the HON30 projects that I build very very nice product. We have one here and I've already put it onto a piece of Pico track. Here's the Pico track. It's a very nice product. I use it for all HON30 projects. It has the plastic ties cast right onto the rail. It's really nice and it's really flexible. You can move it around and do a lot with it. I'm going to join the track sections and the turnouts together with these little HON30 rail joiners. They're sold in a strip like this and to use them I take a pair of diagonal pliers or rail nippers and cut them from the strip. So here's our little rail joiner. I'm going to move it around to get a better position so you can see it. One of the tricks to make this joiner slide on and off the rail easily is to flare the ends a little. And what I'm going to do is take this old jeweler's screwdriver and stick it in the end of the joiner just enough to enlarge it a little. I'm going to stick it in and then just wiggle it back and forth just a little bit to uh, just flare the crimped metal pieces. Then I'm going to turn around the joiner and do the same thing on the other end. Okay, so I've plugged my soldering iron in here, and I'm letting it heat up. 
And I have to tell you, I'm not much for throwing away tools. This is a 30 watt Weller soldering iron. It was purchased at Radio Shack probably 35 years ago. It still works. It works great. I had a tip burn out on it, so I took a piece of copper wire and just cut it to length, screwed it, used the set screw, pushed the copper wire in, tightened it up, you know, put a point on it, and now I have a really nice solder iron that I use almost every day for different things. This stand, I don't know where it came from. This is as old or older than the iron. It didn't come with it because I bought the iron all by itself. So tools are important for track work. You don't need a lot of wattage. But you need enough so that you can make a hot, quick joint. The secret to soldering, and I'll repeat this over and over and over again, is to go in there with a hot iron, make the solder flow, and then get out. And you won't do any damage. The other thing I'm going to talk about a little bit here is using flux. You need flux. You need to use it on every solder joint you make. There is not enough flux in that little piece of solder to properly clean the joint and prevent oxidation. Use flux if you can. I've only had poor joints using the solder all by itself. No matter how clean the rail is, no matter how clean and bright the rail joiners are, you still need some flux to make the solder flow. And the flux does a lot of things. And the more I read about it, the more I understand its purpose is to prevent really fast oxidation while the solder is starting to flow across the metal. So I'm going to zoom the camera in here a little bit, right on this joint, and I'll show you how to make a nice joint that will last the life of your model railroad. All right, here's the joint we're going to make right here. You see I have two rail joiners on the rail, but what I'm going to do, I'm just going to take and I'm going to put a dab of flux on the outside of both of these rail joiners. If any flux gets on top of the rail, you can just wipe it away with your finger. Just remember, the flux is non-corrosive. In fact, the name of it is No Corrode, and you can still buy it in hardware stores. We're going to take our solder, and we're going to put solder on the tip of our iron. As you can see, there's a little on there. And we're just going to touch the joint. And when we touch the joint, the solder will flow. And uh, what I'm looking for, I'm looking for it to flow to the opposite side of the rail. In other words, the side I'm looking at. All right, I've got that side done. And now I'm going to do this side. I'm adding enough solder so that it flows under and around the rail joiner, encapsulating the rail joiner and the rail together. Okay, I've added a couple of rail joiners here and push the length of flex track in place for the branch line that will be on this little railroad. One of the things I didn't mention before is that the ends of the rail should be tight together. And you may have to flex the track a little bit to get them tight, but after the joint is soldered, you can straighten the flex track and trim off any excess rail sticking out on the opposite end. Now I'm going to put a little flex on the outside of the rail and using the same solder and soldering iron, I'm going to put a little bit of solder on the joint. Now I'm waiting to see the solder flow under the joiner and onto the rail on the opposite side. And in this case, it didn't flow, so I'm going to add a drop of solder on the inside of the rail. It's not always a good idea to do this, because extra solder on the inside of the rail may have to be filed away if it interferes with the wheel flanges. I'm looking at my 
joints, making sure they're nice and tidy, making sure we get enough solder in the joint. Okay, that's our little soldering lesson for the day. Let's go ahead and lay some track, and as I lay it, I'll be adding uh, more solder joints here and there as I join the rail together. Now we're ready to lay the track. I like to use double-sided carpet tape for this. The carpet tape is available in places like Home Depot, most large hardware stores, and in stores that sell flooring products. What it is, it's a heavy vinyl tape that's sticky on both sides. So you put down the tape and then you remove the top uh, protective covering from the tape and it's now st sticky side up and sticky side down. And what you do, you push your track in place on the tape using the lines, the black lines that I've drawn on the railroad. We use the black lines as center lines and you can see the center line right through the tape so it's easy to lay the track right over the line that you've created so you get the proper curves and the proper angles on the track. Now you'll notice that you don't need one continuous piece of tape. You can put down many small pieces. Uh, the tape is not very flexible so what I do on curves is just add pieces that are three or four inches long and the track will stick to the areas between the tape just fine because the tape on either side will hold it in place. Uh, once you ballast the track, there's, there's not a problem here because the track will be in place permanently. And uh, the thing I didn't mention is if you ever have to remove this, all you have to do is take a putty knife and wiggle it underneath the tape and the whole piece comes up in, in one section. This is always handy if you have to make changes and you don't want to do damage to the surrounding scenery. Now I'm going to trim the end of this piece of rail that's going to be inside of a building. And for this I use a Dremel tool with a cutoff wheel. And the cutoff wheel is a little different than the one Dremel sells. This cutoff wheel is the kind you get in a, in a hardware store or in a tool catalog. And the reason I like it is because it's a fiber wheel and it's very heavy duty. And here I am trimming up the ends of the rail so that they'll be somewhat even. And don't forget when you use a fiber wheel like this to wear safety glasses because they have been known to break apart and the pieces fly and they're very sharp. So wear safety glasses when you use a tool like this. Now I'm removing the backing from the double-sided tape and you see you have to get an exacto blade under the corner of it and pull it off of the sticky part and uh, then pull it all off. Uh, once you get all of the material off, then it's time to set the track in place. It's always good to have marked the uh, layout ahead of time as to where you want to put things. Here I have marked the uh, blue foam where the turnout will go. So all I have to do is align the turnout and put the black line right in the middle of the straight section of the turnout and kind of lay the track in place. And you can see me doing this here and I'm kind of flexing the track, not really pushing it down because if you do, it'll really stick hard. And this piece here that's going into the uh, large building uh, didn't exactly line up. It's about a quarter of an inch off the black line I drew. Uh, so it's okay because I'm going to build the building around the track. So uh, it's, it's okay where it landed. What I'm doing here, I'm removing the excess uh, carpet tape, the excess sticky stuff, and you'll see me do this as we go. Uh, I want to take up the excess. I only want the sticky part just under the rail and that way it'll help hold ballast in place and it won't be out on the outside where it'll make a little bump when I put the scenery in. With my finger I go over every piece of track to make sure it's firmly in place and flat on the railroad. When I put this turnout down I forgot to cut out underneath the throw bar so that the throw bar wouldn't stick to the double-sided tape. So what I did, I took a long, thin, number 11 X-Acto blade, and I wiggled it in there. 
and cut out underneath so that the turnout goes back and forth freely. Also, I went around to all the track I laid and cut away the excess carpet tape like we did before. Uh, this is an easy job because you use the ties as a guide uh, for your knife. And the beauty is you have the foam underneath so uh, you can cut right into it. So you cut cleanly through the carpet tape uh, when you uh, remove it. Now I'm finishing up the track. There's a few small places as you can see that just need to be finished. I've got a place right here on this end where I'm adding a turnout and I'm also adding a track that'll run off of the uh, little display so that I can attach it to another display later on. I'm using the putty knife here to just lift the end of the track off the double-sided tape so I can slide some uh, rail joiners on it. This is kind of a fussy process laying track but once you learn the fundamentals, once you learn the basics, you can move right along and get a lot of work done in a day. As soon as this last piece, actually there's two pieces here, as soon as they're in place then I'm going to uh, get some feeder wire and drill a couple of small holes or punch a couple of small holes through the styrofoam and put in two sets of feeder wires, one on each side of the display and these will be connected to a DC power pack. Now I'm going to go with DC on this because I'll never be running more than one train at a time. Along with the DC I'm going to use this Electrac Clean device which helps the little engines run better. Last but not least, I've taken some of the little plastic ties and using an X-Acto knife, I've removed the spike heads from the ties so that I can slide them under the rail everywhere we have a joint. And once the rail is painted and the ties are painted and it's ballasted, you'll never notice it. Now I'm going to drop the feeder wires and I'm using this finish nail to punch some holes in the blue foam. This is a very simple process. And next, I have these twisted feeders. This is about a number, I don't know, 18 or 20 wire. And for feeders, you only need a lightweight wire. You don't need much. I stripped the ends of the wire, bent them at a right angle, and soldered them to the rail. The handy thing about a little display like this is that I can turn it over and work on it upside down on the rug. This is very handy. What I've done, I've stripped the feeder wires and I'm attaching them to a bus wire that will run down the center of the railroad. Now the bus wire will attach to the power pack using these things called suitcases. These are made by 3M, they're sold at Radio Shack, Walmart and a bunch of other places. They're a little plastic device with a metal guillotine piece in it and what you do you put your bus wire in one side, put your feeder in the other and then squeeze it together and once it's squeezed together it makes 100% perfect contact and you close the suitcase. So what I've done here, I've soldered the feeders to a bus wire which runs down the middle of the little display and now I'm using a suitcase to attach feeder wires which will eventually go to the power pack and I'm using a solderless connector here, the suitcase because I like them there for the ease of use. It means I don't have to strip a piece of wire in the middle. To, uh, to make a connection. Here's another suitcase going on the minus wire and I'll add another leg of the drop that's going to go to the power pack. Now I haven't decided yet where I'm going to put the power pack for this. I'm going to use a, a small Bachman uh, DC power pack, the kind that came with the Bachman big hauler train sets. And I'm using it because first of all I have one and second it provides just enough power for my HON30 trains. I've wired everything up and I'm using a trailer connector like you'd get in an automotive store to connect the electric track cleaner to the layout. I'm using the little Bachman power pack here and as you can see everything works. So the next step now is to mount the Bachman and the electric clean on the side of the railroad where it's out of the way and then we're going to start with the scenery. 
I'm going to color the rail using this Floquil enamel paint pen. I use these for a lot of different things besides just painting the rail. One of the best uses is to add some rust to car wheels or to an engine's wheels. All you do is take the car, put the pen on the wheel, and turn the wheel with your finger, and it'll give it a nice rust color. To use the pen properly, after you apply some paint to a short section of track, you have to tap the tip of the pen to reload the felt at the tip so that it's full of paint again. The last step to color the rail is to mix a dark earth color. I use uh, cheap craft store enamels. I mix the color and then I daub it on the ties and on the rail. You really don't have to worry about the uh, paint covering up the rail that you've already colored because after it dries it's almost transparent and you can see the rust through the color. What I'm looking for here is just to provide some dust on the ties and the rail. Now we come to my favorite part of building a model railroad and that's building the scenery. What I'm doing here, I have some blocks of one inch styrofoam that have been glued up and they were glued up to make a mountain on another project which didn't happen. So what I did, I took a crosscut saw and I cut them out of the block and the pieces are pretty much the shape that I'd like them, although they're going to be uh, refined by uh, carving them. So what I'm doing, I'm using liquid nails here, and I'm gluing them in place. They're going to be a scene divider, and they'll divide the foreground, which will have sugarcane fields, from the background where the large central or the building where they process the sugarcane will be. So all these shapes are forms now. They're all going to be carved and shaped and uh, contoured uh, to be a little smaller and a little gentler than what you see here. Just a quick tip to show you how to seal a caulking gun. I use a plastic bag and then I wrap it with an elastic band and it lasts for months without drying out. There's no need to stick a nail in it or do any of that other stuff plastic bag and an elastic band and it'll stay soft forever. It'll take all night for the liquid nails to set but after it's set the styrofoam pieces will be held in place permanently and now I can take a hot wire foam factory tool and carve the foam to shape. As you can see here I've modified the tool rather crudely I might add with a piece of styrene that acts as a spring to keep the metal arms, the weak brass arms of the hot wire foam factory tool, to keep them from collapsing. And all the styrene does is to hold the two pieces apart while I drag it through the foam. The wire tool really doesn't get hot enough to cut this foam fast, so you have to be careful, you have to be patient, and you have to do it slowly. What I'm trying to do here is to change the shape of the styrofoam blocks so that they look something like the hills I saw in the photos of the sugarcane railroads in Cuba. The hills are generally uh, low and fairly steep-sided, and some of them look like they were of volcanic origin. So what I'm going to do here as I carve this, I'm going to keep that in mind and try to make them the shapes that I remember from the pictures. Now, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to fill in and around uh, these styrofoam pieces. I'm going to fill them with sculptor mold. Sculptor mold is one of my favorite modeling mediums. It's like a cross between plaster and paper mache. And the reason I like it is because it mixes with water. It sets up in about 20 or 30 minutes. It is easy to clean up because it doesn't stick to the bowl. It doesn't make a big mess. And when you apply it, it will stick to almost any surface. And after it is applied and it starts to set, then you can take a wet brush or you can take a spatula and you can carve it and shape it to look like a rock formation to look like any kind of hill or ground texture that you want. Here along the river 
I'm removing some of the blue foam to make the banks have a more gentle slope towards the water. Here you can see I'm cutting into the road a little bit, but my plan for the road is to put a small retaining wall along the side of the road that abuts to the river. I'm still trying to decide how to build the road. What I think I'll do, I think I'll use pieces of styrene to make the road surface and then I'll cover them with a thin layer of sculpta mold and paint them and add a little dirt texture to the surface. I stood back and looked at the hill and I thought this hill on this end, this little hill here, was much too tall. So I'm taking a couple of inches off the top of it and a little more material off the sides of it. What I want, I want to make sure there's enough clearance for the train at the bottom because I'm going to add a rock formation on the front of the wall facing the track and then again on the other low hill on the other side of the track. I find that I need about two inches between the hill and the track so that I can add a rock casting and still have the proper clearance for the train. Now we're running HON 30 trains and they're a lot narrower than HO standard gauge trains but still you need to have plenty of clearance. You don't want the rock formations right up against the track. Now I'm going to clean up all these scraps that I've created by carving the foam. I'm going to give the layout a good vacuum cleaning and then in part two of this little series I'm going to start the scenery. So I hope you can come back, stay with us, and watch what happens. Thanks a lot. This is Dave Prairie, the Trackside Modeler.